you can't simultaneously claim that you are pro-competition and nonetheless stop there from being anybody who actually wins the competition, which is what market dominance is. What's important here, but in the court opinion, there is not even an attempt to prove that, there e that Google either raised the prices uh, or that it reduced quality, decreased quality of their services in any way. There is only a discussion that Google could do it. They resent the example of somebody who has this dominant ability and the only way sometimes that somebody can uh, evade the fact that someone else displays this ability that you haven't tried to develop in yourself, uh, the only way to evade it is to work to destroy them. People at Google can, are now might be questioning, are they working for a good company? Are they, are they pursuing good goals? Are they creating something useful? It might be devastating to Google. And that's one of the saddest and I think Im most immoral outcomes of antitrust attacks against Google like that. In an antitrust case against Google launched by the Department of Justice, uh, Judge Meta has declared Google a monopolist in violation of antitrust law, specifically, specifically Section 2 of Sherman Act. While still subject to appeal, this is the first major antitrust case the government has won against a tech company, one of the most successful tech companies since Microsoft in 1999. This victory, however, was not reached because of any clear or objective misconduct on Google's part. As we will discuss today, this is a, an outrageous example of non-objective law on government's uh, part and an attack on success of Google precisely for being extraordinary, extraordinary success. Welcome to New Ideal, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. I'm Roberto Dacola. With me today is fellow and instructor Ben Baer. Hi, Ben. Hi, Roberto. Okay, we will start with this, Ben. I first want to talk about why we chose to do this podcast and analyze the case. And of course, uh, the first reason is Ayn Rand had a lot to say about antitrust. And so she had some strong views about antitrust. On one hand, she said it's unenforceable, uncompliable, unjudicable mess of contradictions. Or in other words, it's an instance of non-objective law. And it's one of the first of these that she observed in American history. It's a turning point from a more free society to a more regulated, more authoritarian one of controls rather than freedom. She also pointed out that antitrust coal is targeting successful and productive genius and sacrificing it to the demands of envious mediocrity. So looking at the most successful and big business and trying to give the benefits to the less successful business or more mediocre business. So we will see how both of these points that Ayn Rand made are exemplified or exhibited in the case that we're analyzing. There is out there in the public sphere some commentary on the case and especially in defense of Google, especially from some more free market uh, oriented economists or defenders of Google. But there is nothing there that would call out antitrust for what it is, as Ayn Rand did, as illegitimate, non-objective body of law. Is there any more reason that why we should talk about this, Ben? Well, I think you summed it up well, Robertus. It's, it's worth really just emphasizing some of the things you said. Uh, you're, you're, of course, right that Ayn Rand was a critic of antitrust law as such. Uh, not just particular applications of it. And that's a big part of the reason why ARI has, uh, is not only commenting on this case, but we've commented on the evils of antitrust law for years. Uh, we did it in 1999 when almost nobody was willing to take the side of Microsoft against the Department of Justice. And uh, as, as we'll see, I think today, there's even ways in which the current case against Google is drawing, is drawing on uh, that Microsoft case as a precedent. So we're seeing the fruits of that uh, uh, come to, uh, uh, the chickens are coming home to roost as it were. Um, and we've, we've commented on it regularly since then. It's not just then and now. We, everything from the congressional hearings of tech leaders under the Trump administration to the, uh, the upsurge and so-called uh, hipster antitrust doctrine of uh, Lena Khan at the FTC under the Biden administration. So we've been sticking to this consistently. And it's not just because 
uh, we carry the torch of Ayn Rand and want to uh, want to uh, be consistent with her philosophy and her message, it's it's also because we think what she had to say on the topic of antitrust really brings out what's distinctive and powerful about her philosophy. And you can see the stamps of objectivism all over her position on antitrust. There is obviously uh, the, the aspect of her political philosophy here, the fact that she advocates economic freedom, economic freedom even for big companies, uh, especially for big companies in her view, um, because, because of uh, the second point that's distinctive, which is uh, you see the stamps of her moral philosophy here. Her moral philosophy celebrates the pursuit of happiness. It celebrates the importance of achievement uh, and the role of achievement in attaining happiness. And achievement is embodied uh, paradigmatically in a free market where uh, companies are successful and earn a profit for the value that they have created. And that's exactly what you see happening uh, in this case, except that they're being punished um, for their ability and for their success. And that's that'll be something that we talk more about today. One last point where I think you especially see the distinctive mark of uh, Ayn Rand's philosophy is she uh, repeatedly said she's not primarily an advocate of capitalism or of egoism, uh, but primarily an advocate of reason. And so there's an epistemological aspect of her commentary when she's talking about antitrust law. And that's the way in which it is based on arbitrary reasoning, non-evidence-based, non-objective reasoning arbitrary accusations against the target, in this case, against the successful company. Um, we'll see that today in the various ways in which antitrust law, as uh, it is being applied in this case to Google, is an exercise in the arbitrary, an exercise in tailoring claims to reach a desired conclusion rather than being responsive to evidence from reality. Absolutely. And to make our listeners see that Two, we can turn now to discussing a little bit of a context, setting what happened in the case, what facts uh, were found by the court, uh, and s set some background before we turn to evaluating the whole the whole thing. So, uh, essentially, what the court pronounces is that Google is in violation of the Section Two of Sherman Act for monopolizing, on one hand, general search services market and on the other hand general search text advertising market so what does that mean general search services is the thing that gives you access to the worldwide that web so you go you go online you type in what you're looking for and the google returns your results and directs you to different websites and and resources as against specialized search let's say you go on amazon for shopping or wikipedia for knowledge those are not part of this market of this market the courts the court decides only the general access to the world wide web as google does or competitors like yahoo or bing uh, or DuckDuckGo, which are mentioned in the court are part of the market now general search text advertising is just a corollary issue so if you if you have a alleged monopoly in search then you the sell of advertisements it's the sponsored results that you see when you search something on google it's the first results are something that other uh, websites or companies paid to be on top of the search uh, returned results on google uh, so google automatically almost by assumption has a monopoly there if it has a monopoly in search service in court's opinion and so the evidence they use for establishing that google is a monopoly is on one hand is by this definition of the market Google serves 90% of searches in the United States. It's almost 95% if you consider only mobile search. It's important that we only look at the United States, not global. And we will maybe mention later that it's important to acknowledge that Google is not just competing with other US-based companies uh, and servicing uh, search in the whole world too. Now, second evidence that we use is that by google's own admission and internal documents google does not consider competitors pricing when it sets its text ads we'll talk about this later uh, third piece of evidence is google does not quote consider whether users will go to other specific search providers if it introduces a change to its search product close quote so this is something that the court thinks only a monopoly power 
self-possessing company could do is to make changes without considering whether it will lose customers or no. And the final piece of evidence is court say, thinks there are clear barriers to entry for any competitor. So there are very high capital costs to become a competitive search engine. Uh, there is uh, brand recognition. Google is almost synonymous to search online. People say Google this rather than search this. Uh, Google is massive now. There is scale and benefits from that scale of being such a big network. So all of those are evidence that anybody who, according to the court, anybody who wants to compete, they can't surmount them and actually fight against Google. But now the most important thing for the court is also the second aspect of the case is the exclusivity agreements that Google engages in. So that's at the, uh, at the central to the whole case is that Google pays companies like Apple, Samsung, or providers like AT&T, Verizon, for being a default search engine on their devices. So you buy an iPhone, you search something on their default uh, web browser Safari, you're being led to the web through Google automatically. Or you buy an Android phone, the Google widget is there on the home screen to search through. Uh, or even Mozilla Firefox as a browser uses Google as a search engine. And Google pays billions of dollars to those companies to keep themselves as a default, which the court treats as an anti-competitive practice because it prevents other competitors from being a default choice of search on those devices. There's, a, there's more to say that there is clarifications that it's not we will talk about what the exclusivity issue actually is, but this is the context of the case. And I, I think that's enough to start thinking about what the court is saying. Ben, do you agree? Is there anything else I should say? No, I think that's a good uh, summary of, of what the case is about. Um, I, and I think it, it sets us up enough to start to comment on uh, the, what is wrong with the case, uh, not just this particular application of, antitrust law, but applying antitrust laws ever at all. Uh, and I think a good place to start is this, this, the non-objectivity of both the case and the law. And these are things that come together. So when we talk about the non-objectivity of a law, uh, a big chunk of what we're talking about is whether it is defined in terms that people can actually follow, whether they can, whether it communicates the kind of behavior uh, that is proscribed versus permitted in a way that anybody can understand and comply with. And it, this, this is connected to closely the, the objectivity of the reasoning that's then used to apply the case. Uh, is it reasoning that someone could follow uh, in order to see uh, why they should or shouldn't actually uh, comply with this law. And so let's start with the fact that, so you mentioned, Robertus, that the, the Sherman Act from 1890, uh, the, uh, the case is arguing that it violates section two of the Sherman Act. And what section two basically says is it's illegal to try to monopolize uh, a particular market or e uh, even just attempt to monopolize a particular market. And so the natural question that should occur to anybody who's trying to comply with that law is well, what does it mean to monopolize and a notable omission from the sherman act itself is uh, any definition as to what uh monopolizing is uh now obviously if you're going to apply this uh this act in a courtroom at some point some court needs to decide what monopolizing or what a monopoly actually is and so uh, in the case law for antitrust law, this was eventually decided. Now, it's interesting, um, it wasn't decided until the 1950s, uh, but there's a reason they had to make a decision, and that's because the kinds of cases uh, they were trying to apply this to were clearly not going to fit the conventional, original classical definition of monopoly. You might say, well, you don't need to define every term if there's an already understood definition, but the already understood definition of monopoly uh, going into the 19th century was something like a state enforced franchise. This is, of course, part of where uh, people get their antipathy uh, towards monopoly from. If, if the government says to, uh, let's say, a particular uh, a railroad, you're the only one who's allowed to build railroads in this, in this country or in this region of a country. 
Uh, that's a monopoly in the sense of a state franchise. The state has given this power, this company, and only this company, uh, the legal power to build that railroad. Anybody else is legally forbidden from actually trying to compete with them. If they try, then government will punish them, put them in jail, etc. Exercise the power of law to stop them from doing that. That's what a monopoly uh, traditionally meant: state enforced franchise. The trouble was then that uh, they were trying to apply, and if you look at the historical origin of the Sherman Act, they always intended to apply this law, uh, not to companies that had gotten some kind of state franchise, but simply to companies like uh, the Standard Oil Company uh, run by J.D. Rockefeller, who had uh, become dominant in a free market where they were just very good at what they did and therefore, or, or they were the first ones to do it and therefore were successful. They you know, started to or tried to corner a market in some uh, commodity or in some service. And the thing is that, of course, if you've, if you've become successful in a free market, the, the quote unquote power that you have uh, to exclude comp competitors uh, is a power that you gain through your, your superior ability or your superior product, not through the kind of force of law that that a traditional monopoly has. And so, and you see the way the, the case law is then updated to include this kind of power. The 1956 case that the, uh, that the Google case draws on defines monopoly now, not as a state enfranchised, a state enforced franchise, but as power to control prices or to exclude competitors. And this is, so this is now conflating together uh, the idea of state power where it's illegal to compete with somebody with this kind of economic power where you've, you've, you're, you're out competing somebody, which is of course not the same thing as excluding them by some kind of law. Um, so there's a lot that's now non-objective about this. And one thing that's non-objective is that it's, it's conflating one definition with another, trying to smuggle one in under the cover of another concept, which makes it already unclear what exactly you're talking about. But then the terms in which uh, it tries to define this kind of idea of a monopoly uh, are, are unclear and, and deceptive and invalid in any number of ways. So as we'll see, when we look into the merits of this case, uh, the, the, the prosecutors, the plaintiffs here are trying to argue that Google's a monopoly because as you, as you pointed out before, Robertus, they have they have achieved an extraordinary uh, amount of market dominance. They have you know, high 80%, maybe 90% of the general search market. And the idea there is they're excluding competitors. Uh, but in this conception, you are excluding competitors uh, if you're basically winning a competition. But that suggests that you shouldn't have any winners of a competition. And here, to me, it makes no sense to say this is somehow a pro-competition law or pro-competition policy, as they often and as they always say, because they say Google's anti-competitive. But you can't, you can't simultaneously claim that you are pro-competition and nonetheless stop there from being anybody who actually wins the competition, which is what market dominance is. In any case, free real free markets aren't even about competition as a kind of end in itself. They are about encouraging the conditions of actual uh, value creation and trading values for values. And so it may sometimes be the case that you have to pay more if what you're getting in return for what you're paying is a high value. And it's, it's of course, the right of producers to charge more for a greater value. I think if you study free market economics for a long enough time, you'll realize, of course, that in the long run, prices do come down. Sometimes when there's early innovation, uh, early adopters pay a higher price. Um, and precisely because the innovator is able to uh, corner that market in the thing that they created, but eventually there are competitors and eventually prices are come down. And, and usually prices come down before the competitors. They come from the innovation in uh, reducing the cost of construction, the cost of creation, the way that the innovators are themselves able to do. Um, but Robertus, one other important point to still consider under the heading of how this is very uh, non-objective is looking at the actual reasoning 
of this case. And even though I think it's important that competition is not the fundamental of capitalism, it's not the fundamental of a free market, uh, economic freedom is the fundamental. And in, in economic freedom, you never have real monopolists for reasons we talked about. Even so, if you just take the case on its own terms, you know, determining whether or not it's really true uh, that Google is somehow exempt from competition, the, the kind of reasoning they use to suggest that it somehow is, is arbitrary reasoning. Um, of course, competition is always competition in a market. And the case itself, the plaintiffs in this case themselves will acknowledge there's all kinds of ways in which Google faces all kinds of competition. And you mentioned some of it already in your setup. For example, in the so-called um, uh, vertical search providers like Amazon. I mean, Amazon is increasingly someone's go-to search engine, if you know, at least for a certain kind of category of searches. Anything related to learning about the topics that are in books to, of course, you know, trying to buy things. And that is an enormous source of competition for Google. Uh, Google's trying to be your go-to place to, to search for things that you want to buy too. It even has a whole bookstore that it's, that it's set up. Um, but, uh, and, and the case acknowledges that there's this kind of competition. But because, of course, it still wants to target Google as some kind of monopolist that's able to somehow exclude competition, uh, it has to narrow the definition of the relevant market in which it counts as a monopolist. And so that's why there's that focus that you talked about, about while it's, a, it's maybe not a general search query, uh, it's not dominant in that market, it's dominant in the general search, uh, text search market and the advertising market associated with it. And uh, it's noteworthy that even there, it's not a 100% uh, dominance of the market because there's, there's search engines like Bing and uh, DuckDuckGo and others that draw on Bing's search technology. So they've arbitrarily uh, dismissed all the other ways in which Google is dealing with competitors and having to, having to innovate against them. They've, they've found the one narrow market where they are particularly dominant. And even there, they're not 100% dominant. They have people like Microsoft's Bing to contend with. So it's, it's a real kind of stacking the deck uh, in favor of victory. Um, defining what counts as evidence in just such a way that you can target the very person you want to target. And that is arbitrary reasoning that is in the service of the enforcement of a, a basically non-objective law. And so you can see how th there's a reason why Ayn Rand wrote, when she wrote about this, uh, the, 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 the title she gave to her essay was Antitrust, The Rule of Unreason. Right. It, it, I, I want to interject to have been a little bit from some economic perspective. This is how they, there is an idea behind how they're defining the market. And that idea is that the market is somewhere where you can go to buy or purchase or choose interchangeable products, reasonably interchangeable products. That's the language the court uses. What does that mean? Is it, that there have to be substitutes that you don't really see the difference in choosing. So for example, you go to the store, there are four types of apples, right? Maybe there's gala apples today, but not others. And there might be some minor differences in taste and size and color, but generally it's reasonably interchangeable. You wanna make an apple pie, you can buy the same ones. And so as, a, as they look at it, they don't consider that a competition with apples can be any other fruit or even maybe other veg or any other food. So in Google's example, that would be Google only competes in their eyes with the service providers of exactly the same nature, which would be in their explicitly Bing, Yahoo, DuckDuckGo, and it was Neva, and important probably not, not a lot of our re uh, listeners would have heard of Neva. It was a um, AI competitor that tried to go after Google, but failed and uh, is not in the market anymore. But then the since Amazon or Wikipedia or Booking.com or Expedia where you go or, or, or every website where you would look for flights on a specific airline rather than going for Google looking for flights in general, they excluded as competition just because they have this idea that, well, that's not part of the same market. 
And as you've been indicated, it's because we have, we need to find a way to go after Google and therefore we can define the market however we want. And then in that definition, Google becomes uh, non-subject to competition in the MI. Yeah, and it's, it's worth pointing out that uh, to draw on something you said before, they're able to say that the only reasonably interchangeable product with Google is Bing, which has you know, less than 10% of the market because they have also arbitrarily restricted the market to the US market. So they're not considering uh, the Russian Yandex or the Chinese Baidu, and I'm sure there's others, which if you then include them in the kind of global general search text uh, market, Google is not 90%. And of course, the continuing development of AI makes the fact that these search engines are not in English increasingly irrelevant. Somebody's gonna be able to slap together some kind of plugin that lets you use the other search engines in English uh, so that I think further illustrates why, uh, this is just an arbitrary, uh, arbitrary case for the fact that they don't have competitors, even though whether they have competitors or not, is not the ascent is not the essential. What's the essential for understanding whether there's capitalism, whether there's free markets here is whether there's economic freedom. And, uh, as I think you've, you've another implication of the point that you just made is that the only way that there's really no reasonably interchangeable products um, is if is if you are the innovator who's the one who's created it for the first time which really in lots of ways google is and they've only recently started to get more competition but then what that means is you are defining the monopolists as the innovators if you if you if if the if what it means to dominate a market is to have there's no reasonably interchangeable products well that's exactly what you have when you're an innovator uh, and then that means that you're now defining a monopolist as anyone who's got some kind of state enforced franchise or somebody who's an innovator. And that is just the most destructive kind of package deal uh, definition, one which equates basically stagnation uh, where nobody has to innovate because the state doesn't let anybody else compete with the best kind of innovation where somebody is doing something for the first time at their own, you know, at their own initiative and not because they've been given some kind of government franchise. Um, now, I think somebody might ask, okay, fine. Uh, there's, there's something funny about the way this uh, reasoning seems to target just the successful people, but uh, what if there's some downside associated with that success? What if it means that it harms the consumer in some way? And here, Robertus, you know more about this than I do. Uh, what kind of evidence do they provide of any actual uh, harm to the consumer? Right. Yeah. As you mentioned before, part of what monopoly power is, is to either raise prices and raise, implicitly it's beyond the level they would have if there was no monopoly or to reduce the quality of a product. And that's usually how we think about monopolies is if it's a monopoly, it's probably stagnant, lazy, it gives us bad products, we could have much better lifestyle, much better uh, consumer experience and pay less if it was competitive. So what's important here, but in the court opinion, there is not even an attempt and explicitly not an attempt, they say that themselves, and I'll, I'll read you some quotes which are very revealing to prove that, there, that Google either raised the prices uh, or that it reduced quality, decreased quality of their services in any way. There is only a discussion that Google could do it. So this is, this is what I mean. Google is acknowledged that most of their products, at least for consumers, are free. Everybody can use Google and many, many of their services uh, attached to Google for free. The Google is an amazing product. Everybody loves it. Everybody, like I said, it's a synonym, it's a synonym to search. Uh, already and the advertisers who are the ones paying for being on top of your search query they're engaging in a voluntary trade with google because they think they're getting much much more from that trade paying for being uh, for winning those auctions that google establishes and being on the top with a sponsored uh, query they they think that they're getting a better deal because they're spending that money and a lot of money on being uh, at the top of that search. And so that all is clear and the court is not even trying to challenge that. What they're saying, and that's using a precedent from 1946, uh, 
Here is a quote. I have to read it because it's very revealing. The material consideration in determining whether a monopoly exists is not that prices are raised and that competition is actually excluded, but that power exists to raise prices or exclude competition when it is desired to do so. And then finally, one more point I want to do, I want to say about, say about this is what's really important in objectivity of a case. The court considers only what's happening today. So what's interesting, if you read from the opinion, the court is really explicit. The Google might have risen to the point where they are now through superior foresight and through superior quality against everybody else. That might all be true, the court says. It also says that there are many ways in which Google can be challenged or lose its power and market share and dominance in the market in the future. So there is future potential competition always in the market and Google faces the same, which is why it's paying so many, so much money, billions of dollars to all these providers to say, hey, keep us as a default because they know if they don't, there are so many alternatives to come in the potential future. But the court rejects all of these and says what's relevant for us here in this opinion is only that Google is maintaining their position through these exclusive agreements, which I mentioned in the beginning, the providers like Apple and Simon to be a default engine. It, it's irrelevant that we reached this position to win the contract through superior quality and superior product. And it's irrelevant that it can lose it whenever they stop maintaining or fail to maintain this uh, superior ability in the future. Yeah, I think that's right. It's an enormously narrow view just of uh, the development of an economic market as though as though markets are things that even exist in a in a time slice. Uh, no, they they exist over time. They exist with reference to the past and with a view of the future. And uh, you mentioned different ways that even the default search engine model could be outcompeted. Uh, and you know we've talked about others of them today. Like, what about these other search engines overseas? And what about uh, what about the the fact of AI? It's it's very interesting how the uh, the the court decision explicitly considers the possibility of uh, uh, LLM Chat GPT style uh, AI bots, and it, it briefly considers them and says, yeah, but that's so far down the road we can't consider. Well, I mean, these are very quickly becoming the default search engine for people on general subjects and and the court just kind of completely ignores and dismisses that so that's kind of it's really narrow blind-sided view of the future refusing to even think about what the immediate future might hold here and this is the immediate future we're talking about and then there's the way in which it ignores the past so one of the things that it one of the cases that it makes against these uh, ex exclusive agreements to have google be the default search engine in various uh, uh, browsers is they say it's not a problem that there's a default uh, agreement. Default agreements can be used sometimes for legitimate purposes, they say. The problem is that they are maintaining their competitive dominance through, uh, they're, they're maintaining their market dominance through something other than innovative competition. As though uh, the existence of this kind of exclusive agreement is is something just totally distinct from its ability to innovate and compete. And that's that's just false for lots of reasons. I mean, for one thing, it is a, a business innovation uh, to come up with that kind of exclusive agreement. It certainly doesn't occur to everybody. Um, somebody had to create these other search engines and these other these sorry, these other browsers and other forms of uh, forms of uh, applications where Google could run. And then somebody had to think, oh, those might be a way into our search engine. We should make an agreement with them and make it worth their while and figure out what it would take to make it worth their while. And the the case actually details all kinds of negotiations that had to happen between Google and these other companies like Apple to figure out what how much it would be worth to make it worth their while. And they had to figure out a price. Um, so that's an innovation right there. But even leave that aside, suppose you thought that was the simplest, most obvious uh, business move in the world to make. Well, you wouldn't be able to make it unless you had profited from your previous innovation. So it is a form in which Google is exercising its past innovation uh, and the fruits of that past innovation to continue to ensure it. But they have the, every right to do it. And the, and the people they make the agreement with have every right uh, to make that deal with them. So it, even if you thought the existence exactly. of competition was, was a 
was a, a standard here that was relevant, which I continue to say it's not. The case as a completely arbitrary way of dismissing the competition that continues to exist in the present, the future, and what competition existed in the past that made this success possible. Think about it, these exclusive agreements while we're here, Ben, is I think this is an example of blatantly, blatant double standard of application of law. So court, like you said, acknowledges that exclusive agreements are generally legitimate in many industries and contexts. Even it's, it even says that Google, when it was smaller, when it was developing, when it was growing, is, was legitimately using this as a business strategy to become a default and grow, grow like that. However, what makes it illegitimate now for Google, but legitimate for its competitors, for example, is that it's dominant. So it's only the change of your economic status in, your, in the eyes of consumers, in the eyes of your partners, that suddenly changes how the law applies to you and how it applies to everybody else, including your competitors. So isn't that just at an absolute breakdown of what rule of law is supposed to stand for or equality before the law? I, mean, I think it is, uh, though you have to be careful about the reason for why. So the, the, the main reason why is certainly an attack on uh, rule of law is for all the reasons we've just discussed, it is an attack on the idea of objective law, that th these laws do not encode any kind of behavior that someone can consistently follow uh, without being uh, arbitrarily uh, attacked by the law itself. So you don't have rule of law if your law is not objective, if it's not defined in terms that are objective, and defined in terms people can understand, you can communicate to them what they need to do, and in a way that people can actually comply with if they try. And the fact here is you cannot be a business person who is trying to be successful as a business person, and at the same time, uh, not run afoul somehow of these uh, antitrust laws, because as as we've started to make the case for, and we're about to make an even bigger case for, uh, what they're really doing, although they don't make it explicit, is outlawing winning a competition, outlawing the winning of a business competition. And yet that is what every business person who wants to go into business is trying to do. And that's what business is for, is to make a profit. Um, so is this a double standard? Well, in one sense, yes. In another sense, no. It's certainly true that uh, the antitrust laws allow you to engage in a certain kind of behavior as long as you're not successful. And so it's a double standard in the sense that it applies to the successful and not to the non-successful. But that's only really a double standard if you, uh, if you didn't think in the first place that the whole purpose of these laws was to target the successful. Um, and I mean, I think we're starting to see the evidence that, it, that, as, that is in fact the actual purpose, even if it's not overt, even if it's not explicit. And it doesn't take much to make it explicit, especially when you look at some of the things that uh, this, the plaintiffs in this case are doing. And Robertus, we should now, we should now do that. Let's, let's make that explicit because it's quite revealing how much in this case there is. Okay, so it's clearly, what, what can show us that it's an attack on success is uh, the plaintiffs are saying, look, when Google is at fault, people don't change to other search engines. So for example, if, if Google is a default on an uh, Apple device, there is an option for maybe you, you can go into the settings and change it into a different search engine. So that's not prevented, but people just don't do that. As the court says, uses some behavioral economics arguments and others that uh, this is the power of defaults. People are just following the habit. And as long as the product is good enough, they don't make an effort into changing into something else. But now, now there were experiments, of course, and, even, and Google did that research themselves and Mozilla Firefox, where Google is a default search engine, did that, that if you switch, if you make something else a default, uh, Bing rather than Google, for example, more than a third of people immediately in the first instances or days go and change it back to Google. And it's clearly, and the court is, uh, and the judge is clear that that's because Google has this dominant brand, it has dominant quality, and people recognize it, and people want to go back to it when it's not a default engine for you. So there is obviously an attack that, look, 
if being a default is not really an issue by itself, it's only an issue when you have a dominant product that people want to use anyway. So that that's a, one of the clearest indications that what covers the court and the laws about Google is that it is it is clearly big and successful and people actually do put an effort to choose Google rather than something else. There is also nothing explicitly exclusive in Google's agreements that are the target of the case. So all the agreements allow both, uh, let's say, Android devices to put different widgets to different search engines together with Google. So you can choose one or the other. Like I already mentioned, Apple devices allow you to switch to any other engine. Browsers allow you to switch to other engines. So there are options and the customers are not prevented and the partners to, for which, to which Google is paying enormous amounts of money are not prevented from looking for, from providing the alternatives to their, to their consumers. But since, as I already described, consumers don't really do that, even if they have the options, then the agreements become de facto exclusive. So they're not exclusive legally or explicitly, they're exclusive implicitly just because Google is a, has a superior product. And that's what the plaintiffs are offering as another part of evidence against Google. It amounts to that the only reason Google is being attacked and sentenced now is because their agreements make, make them de facto or practically default. And if some other companies even made that agreement, there is evidence or reason to think that people would still switch back to Google. And that's unacceptable in the court's eyes. That's what they're targeting. Yeah, I'm, I'm generally surprised by how nearly explicit this decision is in admitting that the problem with Google is how, how good it is, uh, how high quality the product is. Uh, I'll, I'll just cite a couple of particular examples where I think this really comes to the surface. You already mentioned some good ones yourself, but in related to one of the ones that you mentioned, uh, part of how they make the case for the idea that uh, Google is able to exclude competitors, because to be able to be a uh, monopolist, you have to exclude competitors somehow. They, as you mentioned, uh, don't try to offer direct evidence of you know, prices actually rising in a, in a, a way that harms consumers, uh, but just by structural factors. And one of the structural factors they cite is the so-called barriers to entry. And what's one of the barriers to entry that they mention? Brand recognition. <laughs> I'm quoting here, page 159, record evidence firmly established that Google's brand is widely recognized and valued. That's the evidence they offer for the fact that there is brand recognition and which they offer as a barrier to entry. So Google is just recognized by people as good. And that, that is what stops people from uh, competing with them, a so-called barrier to entry as though uh, people's uh, brand preferences are deterministic um, uh, functions in, in what they're able to use, uh, as though Google has programmed them all to, to not use competitors. And that's their, that's their brand, that, that's their uh, barrier to entry. But an even better example than that, I mean, that's a view about, that's a point about people's perception of Google. They're admitting people's perception of Google is a, a brand a barrier to entry. But how about this? Leave aside people's perceptions. There are places in this document, in the case, in the, in the course decision, where they say that Google is good. Part of what makes it good as a search engine is that it is market dominant. Why? Well, I mean, just the technology of it. Because the more people are using it, the more searches there are, uh, the more data Google has to refine its technology and make their search technology even better because they know what kinds of things people click on after they do their search. And so they know what kind of things people are actually looking for in response to their kind of search. So the more they dominate the market, market the search engine actually gets better. Um, I mean, to me, it's, it's questionable whether you could even have high quality search without there being this kind of market dominance because of the network effects that are involved there. And, and it's the same with advertisers. The advertising is able to target users better the more search data is built into the advertising. 
And so it's precisely the fact that it's dominant search that makes the advertising so well targeted. And that's another way of saying, if you've got market dominance, uh, it, that's what makes you a monopolist. But that's another way of saying, especially with search technology, the better your search technology is, the more you are a monopolist. But then that is really ridiculous, basically saying that if you have a good product, um, it's illegal. And that's just perverse. Right. So Ben, perverse. There is an idea Ayn Rand has invented or created, and she called it worse than envy. She called it hating the good for being the good. So do you think of this case as an example of that, rather than an example of simple, let's say, envy on some, from competitors that they want to have what Google has. They recognize what Google has this is good, the court recognizes it as a big value. Uh, they're both their product and their dominance. And they so there are definitely companies and competitors like Neva, who was a plaintiff in the case, uh, not a plaintiff, a witness, a witness in the case, who would really like to be like Google. But the idea of hatred of the good is something that you just are angry or you or you don't want somebody to be as successful as they are just because of the fact that they are successful and good. Can you say more? Is that an example? Do you think that is the case an example of that? I think both factors that you mentioned here are, are likely involved in a case like this. And it's, but it's worth distinguishing exactly what the difference is and why it matters. So uh, envy can simply mean wanting something that somebody else has. And if you're talking about wanting literally the same thing that the other person has, um, you're talking about a desire for the unearned. And that's, of course, uh, a bad enough as it is. And I think in many cases, that's what's motivating certain competitors uh, to support antitrust legislation because they, they really wish they could be as successful, say, as Google is. They wish they could have some of that actual success, which means taking it away from the person who actually earned it. Uh, that's one thing that people call envy. That's bad enough uh, because you know, you're trying to get something that isn't actually yours. But in Ayn Rand's essay, The Age of Envy, she's talking about something else. And she, said, she calls it the age of envy because she says there's not really a single word in English that captures the other thing that she's talking about. She, the best that she can say is give the description of hatred of the good for being good. Uh, and as I think you rightly point out, it is, it's different from a simple desire for the unearned. Uh, it's, it's the kind of thing that somebody wants when there's nothing that you can do to the other guy to actually get what they have. All you can do is tear them down. Um, and, and I think that that may well be part of what's sometimes motivating the, the would-be competitors who've lost, because now they've already lost, right? They, they, there's nothing that the, the court is going to give them at this point that will um, you know, make up for the fact that they lost, make up for the fact that Neva couldn't compete with Google, for instance. I don't know, this is exactly what's happening with the people who ran Neva, but um, you know, it's the sort of thing that a, 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 somebody who failed in the past, it, it could be motivating them. Um, and you know, a sign of that here, by the way, is that this is so uh, backwards looking. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not as though uh, the people who lost in their attempt to compete with Google, who wanted to start up a rival search engine. It's not like any of them uh, are you know, starving in the streets or something and uh, need recompense. I mean, they all got, they funded their company with venture capital. Um, you know, they don't have to pay that venture capital back. You know, they, they get to put on their resume that they started this, uh, this company for a while, and now they're all off working at different software companies. So it's not like there's some harm that's been inflicted on them, um, which they need to be recompensed for. No, it's, it's just that they uh, are, really, are really kind of sore that they lost this battle. And um, I think, yeah, when you get into that kind of territory, there's a real possibility what we're talking about here is resentment for the fact that somebody else was able to succeed at something that you weren't able to succeed at. And I suspect that that's less of a factor for some of the people who were maybe the ones who lost the competition, though I suspect it could be part of it. Uh, it's, it's more often what's motivating the people who are the advocates and defenders of antitrust law. 
um, the scholars who write in defense of it, the judges who rule in favor of it, where uh, they're not even uh, somebody who is party to this competition, and they're simply looking at it from a distance and thinking, wow, here's, here's somebody, in this case, Google, who they had, they really developed some ability. They really exercised some ability in a way that, uh, yeah, I was never able to do that. And, and, and I, I, they resent the example of somebody who has this dominant ability. And the only way sometimes that somebody can uh, evade the fact that someone else displays this ability that you haven't tried to develop in yourself, uh, the only way to evade it is to work to destroy them is to work to eliminate them from having to think about them by, by tearing them down. And that's why it's significant that nobody actually benefits from this uh, kind of tear down. It's, it's, it's simply the kind of nihilistic act of tearing them down that, that uh, gives people a certain kind of sense of security with themselves. Uh, and, and why would that be? Well, because that example that the successful person poses to them is, is give, makes them feel insecure for some reason. I see. That is tragic. I'm still not 100% convinced that is a, this case or the supporters of a case is an example of that, but it's something I like to think about more. But there is there one more thing that I want, I think I'm more, much more convinced of. And again, because the case on the judge is surprisingly explicit and uh, ab about it in his writing. And that is an issue of mixing up the economic power and political power. So in the case is they describe when we talk about entry barriers, something that prevents competitors to work uh, against Google or to capture some of the market share, they make a list. And this is what's interesting to observe, but in the same list, we have legal licenses, which Ben, you talked about. It's something that the government provides for a company and then uses to forcefully prevent anybody else to entering the market or doing that activity. Uh, only, only those who get the legal license from the government can engage in that. And of course, there are multiple examples, like for example, nurses, you can only be a nurse if you get, a, if you get that license. Now, in the same list, they have entrenched by your preferences. So I'm used to using Google, and that's the same barrier to entry, according to the court, uh, for a competitor who would like me to use their engine as it would be a legal license granted to Google to be the only legal engine or high capital entry costs. It's really expensive to run Google and to do all the research and manage the technology. So those who don't have the capital, of course, have a difficulty to competing. Economies of scale. Google has a big network. It, it benefits from the data it gets. It can improve its product uh, much more and it has reach. Uh, and those who don't have the skill right now, of course, that's another difficulty for them to go go up. But the important point here, now that we already covered some of this, is that this barriers in, in the in the opinion, and they're treated as if they're the same as the legal licenses, as, as the power of the government. So I wanna I wanna ask you Ben to say a little more on this distinction of economic power and political power and force. Uh, what is the essential difference between the two and what the court would benefit from understanding and treating and how to treat Google? Well, on this one, uh, rather than being the one to articulate it myself, let me let Ayn Rand do the explaining because she is the one who informed my thinking on this one and who I think expresses it more clearly than I could. And so. Uh, let's let's put a quote from her essay, America's Persecuted Minority Big Business, where she talks about the issue of antitrust up on the screen here. And here's the way she distinguishes the two concepts that are being conflated here. Economic power is exercised by means of a positive, by offering men a reward, an incentive, a payment, a value. Political power is exercised by means of a negative, by threat of punishment, injury, imprisonment, destruction. The businessman's tool is values. The bureaucrat's tool is fear. And I think you can, you can really see how this distinction applies in the case of Google from the fact that, I mean, what Google is doing is offering us positive values in just a multiplicity of ways. They are offering us a superior search technology made superior in part by the network effect of how many people use it, which is because of its market dominance. 
Uh, and they're offering it to us for free. Of course, they charge advertisers uh, to be able to tap into that network. Um, but that's because, again, they're offering the advertisers this powerful uh, positive value, the access to the customers, which the search technology gives them a superior ability to target um, because of their queries. So it's, it's about value creation uh, from soup to nuts on every level, uh, not any element of the negative threat of punishment that uh, it's being conflated with here. It's, uh, it's only when a government threatens somebody uh, from entering a market by you know, giving somebody a legal franchise that you have any kind of uh, threat of punishment. And what's especially rich here is that it's antitrust law that is now, of course, making that threat of punishment applicable to Google. Um, that's where the political power is actually entering into the equation here. When, when government says, no, you're not allowed to offer this positive value to people because you are a quote unquote uh, monopolist. And it's, this, it's the conflation of these two kinds of power, the economic and the political power, that, that makes the kind of redefinition of monopoly uh, in terms of ability to control prices and exclude people from competition, the definition that this case is using, it's, it's that conflation that uh, makes uh, that definition plausible. Because as we talked about before, the term originally meant uh, excluding people from market using only political power. Um, interestingly, in this case, the, the way that this conflation works and this redefinition of the concept of monopoly works is by trying to compare the, the economically dominant uh, company like Google uh, to a government monopolist. Uh, just like in the, in the arguments that happened over the Sherman Act at the end of the 19th century, it, it compared, uh, they tried to compare uh, industrialists who had won in the competition to create the superior product, compared them to kings who uh, tyrannically sit astride a people so it's trying to ape a kind of concern for the oppression of victims. Interestingly, in this kind of case, uh, that is really aping concern for victims because to do that, especially in a case like this, you have to think of the victims with such contempt, um, such that you have to think of them as pawns uh, who don't have any choice in the matter over which kind of search engine they're going to use, as though just setting a default setting has somehow brainwashed these consumers into using it as though they don't have any choice. And of course, Robertus, you've already mentioned the fact that there's a, there's, there's a good amount of data saying even when you change the default to someone other than Google, the customers go back to Google because they think it's better. And so then you have to bring in elaborate psychological theories, like they have this theory of default bias, uh, that just because the customers have been used to using Google in the past, that's what makes them, it forces them um, to want to change the default back to Google as though, as though consumers have, have never been able to observe for themselves what kind of quality product Google's able to deliver. And yeah, it's true. Some people get into bad habits, you know, uh, because of ignorance and not because they've made any of these observations, but then to, to punish the people who have actually formed a habit for good reason, because they've observed what's good about Google in the past and want to keep that habit to punish the people who have a habit for a good reason because of the stupidity of some people who have it for a bad reason. Um, it is really contemptible and, and treats consumers and customers with contempt out of some kind of faux concern uh, that they are uh, victims. And I should just add to put a punctuation point on this, that this is, this is exactly what you would expect uh, from somebody who is targeting the, uh, the successful competitor in a market like this because of a kind of hatred for success, because nobody wants to admit that they hate success. Nobody wants to admit that they hate the good. Um, they need to have some kind of rationalization that they give not just to audiences beyond them, but a rationalization they give to themselves uh, to explain to themselves, no, I don't hate the good. I'm, I'm just trying to uh, stop people from being oppressed. Uh, and so this is just the kind of conflation uh, between economic and political power that you would expect from somebody who really does have a problem with successful companies and successful people. It's just the rationalization that they need um, uh, to justify what they're doing to themselves. And what you said, it's a condemnation of 
all those people. I think there's another group of people that are really com condemned here uh, illegitimately. And it's, it's all the people working for Google. And what this case, regardless of how it ends, uh, because like I mentioned in the beginning, the Google can appeal the case still, and there is not even sentencing yet uh, of what is the remedy, proposed remedy or not a remedy, it's more actually the, uh, the punishment to Google is going to be uh, proposed by the court. But we know from Microsoft's case on which, again, the Google case is built, that the people who joined Microsoft, they joined it because it was an amazing company. They probably thought that they're changing the world for the good. They're developing amazing products, improving our work environments, improving our personal uh, environments and devices. And they wanted to create, build, program all of those things that Microsoft was known for and dominant for. And after the antitrust case, the Microsoft antitrust case, which again was also appealed and the remedy was not uh, that at least from legal perspective, that big. They wanted to break up Microsoft. They end up not not breaking up Microsoft, just putting some regulators on them and, and some other issues. But it was such a devastating case for to the culture of the company. Bill Gates never recovered, never has never been the Bill Gates from before the antitrust leading the company to amazing achievements. He stepped out as a CEO and, and then that led to him stepping down to, and just focusing hard on his uh, other activities. And Microsoft took a decade, it, it, it grown and it changed it completely, but it took a decade to reinvent itself and to recreate the culture uh, of think, thinking of ourselves, of employees of Microsoft as good, as, it, as pursuing something great, rather than questioning whether, are we doing actually something evil? Are we uh, this sort of, this group of people that, that should be punished or should step down or should not do what we want to do is to create the best products. And for Google, regardless of how the case ends up, be, uh, ends up, this is what it can do. The people at Google can are now might be questioning, are they working for a good company? Are they, are they pursuing good goals? Are they creating something useful and great and valuable? Or are they just now serving something bad or or almost evil, which is what the antitrust claims Google is doing. So it, regardless of the end, it might be devastating to Google. And that's one of the saddest and I think most immoral outcomes of antitrust attacks against Google like that, because all these people who want to create value and bring value to the world are now being put on this I don't even know how to, uh, how to say on, are presented as the sources of evil or misery rather than value and, and, po and positive creation. I think we should wrap up then. The last thing I want to say is, uh, so this case was launched by the Department of Justice and uh, it was launched in January 15, 2021, which was the last week of Trump administration, which means that the case was prepared still in the during the Trump administration also, 10 of uh, the majority of the states that are plaintiffs in this case, together with the Department of Justice, are Republican states. Contrary to when you, what you would think, that it would be launched more by the Democrats. Uh, so what I want to underscore and I think say is that this is not, doesn't seem, or it's not in my eyes, a political issue. It's a bipartisan attack on business. It's supported by both sides. Uh, and it's it's a not a shift that can be prevented by certain elect electoral results or, or electoral outcomes it can only be prevented by ideas the resurgence of antitrust and this uh, about four years ago on Kargata in a conversation with aaron smith on this podcast discussed about the source of where this resurgence of putting more teeth into antitrust came from ideas published in harvard by people like lena khan who is now at the head of the Federal Trade Commission. It, it, it started the ideological shift of how antitrust should be enforced. And then you mentioned some of that in the beginning too. Uh, and it can only be tackled with ideological change and ideas too, not political solutions per se, which is I hope 
what this conversation contributed to uh, a little bit more. Uh, so any any last words, Ben? No, I think you said everything I, I, I wanted. I was hoping you would say. Okay, great. So some some of the resources that we mentioned in this podcast is uh, that you want might, might want to check is Ayn Rand's essay, America's Persecuted Minority, Big Business. We referred to, to it multiple times. It's in the collection of essays, uh, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. Uh, another, uh, another essay we talked about is Antitrust, the Rule of Unreason, uh, Ben quoted from it, and it's in her book, The Voice of Reason. Uh, you can you see links uh, on the screen and they would be, be put on the description. You can also check the Ayn Rand lexicon entry, Antitrust Laws. Uh, you can search it on Google. <laughs> it's available from there. Uh, and of course, if you enjoyed this podcast, enjoyed this episode, please subscribe uh, on our channel on YouTube or whatever you're listening. Uh, click that bell for notifications uh, and uh, please comment if you have questions, share this episode if you think it's valuable to other people. And uh, if you have any suggestions or questions for the future to us, you can always reach us at the new ideal at ironrant.org. Uh, we read your emails and reply to many. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Robertus.